I think just by our dialogues, like there's gonna be a lot of contrary. Like they're gonna pick apart what we didn't say. Oh yeah. As if we have like the mind to say everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is just how we're feeling now in the context of artists who work together on the same medium. Yes, it does change. You know, when we turn that camera on and, and we start shooting things with people, it does change things. And I think that's just a fact. Um, I think, you know, documentary filmmakers can't say that they don't change things when they do this work. No child or person should go without, not in Canada, that each child and person's entitled to the basic needs like anyone else. And it shouldn't matter if you're Métis, First Nations, or Inuit, or on reserve, or living in town, that everyone should access services. Okay, I'm Marie Burke, and uh, originally from the Lac La Biche area. What is My name is uh, Jeff Pronto, AKA Day By. Uh, my name is Sharon Desjoy, and I'm also Cree, Metis, Jibway, and French. And I'm Beth. Uh, my heritage goes back to Jibway or Anishinaabe. My name is Myron Lehman. I'm a uh, uh, from the Beaver Lake Cree Nation in uh, northern Alberta, nearby Lac La Biche. My name's Terrence Houle. I also go by TJ Houle. Uh, I'm a Blackfoot Ojibwe, uh, registered to the Blood Tribe. have to be able to show people that this is real. These people live like this. Even people in the modern age, even us filmmakers, we still live like this. And, and we live like this for a reason, because it keeps us healthy. It's about that choice, that choice that you can, you can make to make yourself better, you know? Because ultimately it's your choice, right? Like whether you're an alcoholic or whatever, it's your choice to recognize that and to like deal with it and rectify it or a drug problem or whatever it is, whatever these issues are. Like the healthness of your community is always judged by those choices, right? So the individual and the collective. So when I thought of health and wellness, that's what I thought was just making this choice, making that choice to like, to say, no, I'm, I'm, this is what I, I'm, I'm going to survive and endure. You know, and I think Aboriginal people have always sort of made that choice, you know, like they've always sort of persevered through, you know, both my parents are residential school, you know, they're like, what, third generation residential school each. They come from 12 and 12 kids, you know, half their brothers and sisters killed themselves and, you know, all sorts of crazy shit. But like, do you, do you, do you, you know, do you make that choice to sort of practice your culture, your, your things to make you better? Or do you wallow in that, you know? Greetings all my relations. My name is Warren Winnipeg, also known as Kim. My Indian name is the significant one. The story I'm about to share is my story. I was born in 1969 during a time of significance for our people and the world. My life at that time was around unconditional love and that it was a time for forgiveness. And that the reason and the purpose I was born it was to fulfill a mission in life. We had lost seven children to a house fire due to alcohol-related incident. At the time when my mother had lost 
those children, she turned to alcohol. My mother had seen the, the pain that my aunt was going through and turned to my aunt and told her to raise me and that I would be her child. I was put into foster care and, and experienced many foster families. I had to experience different forms of abuse and the sadness that I had in the separation from family. And also having to be assimilated in the community, into the Western way of life. I was very hard on myself and it eventually developed into self-hatred. And because of that, I tried to take my life on numerous occasions. I tried to find love in places, but I was never happy. I learned three golden rules very well. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. And these three golden rules are what kept me sick and my life was in chaos. And it wasn't until something happened to me that made me change. I became someone that I did not like. And one of the things that I really had difficulty with was trusting men because men violated me as a child. And because of that, I had to learn a healthier way of looking at the world in men. In order to better myself, I had to go back to school. And for me, that was a huge achievement. I'm the first one in our family to ever get a college education. I decided I'll go further, and I went on to university. I learned in this journey while I was reviewing these patterns about my family that there was also some strengths. And some of those strengths that emerged was the spirituality of my family. After looking at some of those strengths, I learned I had to apply those things to my own life. And so some of the medicines that I use today also have been really helpful to me. I've been able to walk through dark times in my childhood and be able to use that teachings to my benefit to my advantage by helping other people and now I work with the cross ministries and the government just around Aboriginal youth suicide prevention speaking on behalf of our young people that need to be heard this work that we're doing is often a road less traveled and it's a road that is known as um, the Red Road. And then the only way that we can actually make a change or a difference is to actually role model it ourselves. An elder said that the only resource that will ever sustain us in life is our youth, and that our languages need to transfer to the younger ones so that they too can speak our ways and also practice the ways. The answers lie within the communities. When I approached the elders about what we should do to prevent suicide in our communities, they told me that suicide is a spirit and that the only way we can prevent it is to actually pray.
For my children, they're at a different time. Like they're not close to their land, their people. We live far from our community. And I, I, I try to work, I guess, in a sense, what my parents almost lost, while well, my grandparents, when they lost their children and their way almost, I, I try to uh, look back and see how could I keep my family strong or my children strong with their identity, their values, their pride, despite what they go through, because I feel they go through a lot than what I went through as a child. They're exposed to a lot more. So I think it's a challenge daily, not a challenge, but each person has their own journey in life. And what upsets me is when people dictate or judge or exclude people for what they believe. And it upsets me, even elders, how, like we're supposed to be like harmonious people or loving or respectful, but a lot of times I don't see that. And it's, I try not to look at the, the negative aspects, but they are there. And sometimes we hurt our, each other more than other, than other races hurt us. I often think that Aboriginal people have, create more problems for their own people sometimes. And, and that sometimes we oppress ourselves, that that has to be something that we comment on. I mean, you look at like the issues around the band the band and council, you know, and, and, and sort of dictating a lot of things, you know, and, and that, uh, you know, there's a lot of nepotism, you know, there's a lot of, pe there's a lot of our own people dealing drugs to our own people, prostituting our own people, you know. I wanted to know, I guess, why there was a lot of pain in my family why a lot of my family members suffered and why I myself was suffering with, with identity, with um, feelings of worthlessness and not belonging and all those things. And some of the elders w that I talked to would say, you know, it's not you. And it's not like, because I was always thinking, I want my, something better for my kids. And they'd say, no, it's not, sometimes it's not you. Sometimes something happened before you, like in your grandparents or their, grand, or their parents, and it was never corrected. Someone never went back and found out the truth and made it right. Mm -hmm. And so you were past that legacy without you even knowing.
This is like when I'm 13, 14. And then my, all the, my older friends were 15, 16. And we're all just drinking. Everyone was drinking. And <clears throat> just bored. And you could just see the boredom and like nothing to do. So there's this empty lot beside the parking lot. We just go outside. And then we're hanging out in this empty lot. People are smoking. And then someone picks up a rock. A car comes. Starts throwing rocks at cars. Picking up handfuls of gravel. Starts throwing them at cars as they come by. Cars are like peeling off. And then this one girl, she, she goes, to the, goes to the big rock pile, picks up a brick. She goes, dare me? And everyone's like, yeah. So she like actually hauls down a cab. Cab comes, pulls up. She, right through the back window of the cab. Just no reason. Just bored. Boy, it was just weird going back home and seeing how much things have changed since I left. Because, like, I always thought that, oh, maybe, maybe I'll leave since, and some other kids will step up. And some of them did, and they got shut down, and they just gave up. Oh, well, we'll just get high and play video games, and <laughs> that was it. They just gave up on the whole thing. Because that really was, like, a big deal for us, to go out and play hockey at the gym or wherever. I mean, and it was a... I don't know, it was, like, I know it sounds really cheesy, but, like, it really just, like, it, it was a change in all those kids. Like, a lot of them, they didn't even drink or anything. They didn't go out and party anymore. They would rather come and play hockey. There's no belief in our youth. There's no funding set aside for our youth because the chief wants an SUV, and so does his, his brother. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, there's this money being spent in ways that could be helpful for the community, especially the youth. But the youth are the ones who are always taking, taking the back seat, like the hand-me-downs, and like mm -hmm. because they don't. The chief and council, a lot of chief and council, I find, don't believe in the value of our youth. They're just kids, you know. And now I'm dealing with the federal government, and you know, I I manage 15 million dollars, or like you know, it just becomes this really, you know, uh, it's the same situation. They're just basically doing what the Canadian government is doing to us. It's that's a learned thing, and. There are youth out there who are positive and proactive about, you know, um, the community, who care about the health and wellness of the community, but also try, by, by an example, practice uh, healthy living and being creative and finding outlets to spend their energy as opposed to getting in trouble. They wear masks, they wear masks they wear and underneath the mask, the masks, perverted, 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 twisted, twisted, twisted crippled, crippled, shut up, don't wear a mask, you don't have to. I just went out and I sell, I've been selling native artwork on the street for about six years now. On the street in front of department stores like Michael's, Safeway, Staples, uh, Sellers, uh, Indigo, uh, everywhere up in West Hills. I've been, I've, I do it everywhere around the city. I set up artwork, that's, that's what I do. I draw, I reprint my artwork over and over and over again. That's the otter. He doesn't dwell on the past or the future, but he lives in the present by enjoying life and just flowing with it. The otter. Keep the pesticides away from our plants, or uh, even our food, our vegetables and everything that we use. Keep it all away from that stuff because what we put inside our body affects the way we think, the way we feel. If we could like set up some sort of organize, some sort of program where all these kids can get the funding to be in these programs if they wanted to, or maybe if we even if we set up our own type of program, like our own like hockey league. I myself try to use, eat healthy by eating organic food. So I, in the back there I grow, me and my girlfriend, we grow our own vegetables right there and there. We got our garden, we got our own machine right there. We grow garden, we grow our own food out there. I go to the health food store, I try to buy as much as the things I can from there, but unfortunately I'm a native artist that sells native art on the street. I don't have much money, so I can't like constantly eat everything organically because it's really expensive. Uh, nobody really cares to even try to do that. I don't understand why they don't care, honestly. I just, I don't know why they don't. Like, I go to my family's house and stuff, and you know, there's lots of meat on the plate. It's none of it's organic, and all the food that they're using is non-organic. Even when I go out there, it makes me even more madder when I see them, like, using styrofoam plates. 
styrofoam nips. You know, you, you go to a function and you see everybody using styrofoam plates, everyone eating this meat, and you know, and it's, it's like they say, well, you know, we're meat eaters, we've been eating meat for years, but you know, I looked into it and our people, we would go, we'd have dry spills of not eating for a couple days. We'd eat a lot of meat and we'd, we'd have this buffalo and we'd eat a certain amount of meat and then we wouldn't eat for like a couple days, you know? And the meat that we were eating was local. We caught it ourselves, and there was nothing pumped with any steroids. It was just beautiful, fine stuff. Of course I would eat that meat. But the stuff we're eating now, it's just like, it's just, it's nasty to know the way that the cows are treated, they're like it's not, it's, they're just pushed through those kennels and then, I don't know, I don't, I'm, I'm not doing too good with this whole situation. Just like native kids are losing their culture because, uh, uh, it's, it's not cool for them to do or it's not like, uh, uh, I don't even know how to put it, um, there's just no interest anymore. Like you go to powwows and you go to stuff like that and it's slowly dwindling and even the language is dwindling, but you know, the city doesn't help that at all. I find, you know, there's a few people to try and keep it together and stuff, but the interest isn't there for the kids. So they just say, screw it. A few people are like, we're like Ryan here who actually, you know, go out and promote healthy native living and you know, actually being a positive person. Thank you creator for everything you've given us. Our food, our clothes, our home, our shelter. All the friends and family love us. And I ask you, the Creator, and the spirits and animals of this world to help guide us in our goals to be able to complete them. Help open our minds to be able to see the truth, to be able to do good things. Also help us emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Our relate all our relations. All right. We have footage of them uh, you know, skateboarding, right? So that's kinda like that's a substitute for like conventional exercise and you know, just kinda making yeah. this contrast where there is some sort of where there's ways for them to you know, sort and also like like graph and hip hop, we're all incorporating all those elements. So it's trying to like, you know, how for like as a subculture can be, a, you know, can be a positive thing for youth in the city, and it's just sort of that, you know, helping them. Absolutely, much. absolutely. Like um, you say, attest to that because um, through you say can new tribe, and that's where we found Ryan. Absolutely. How many times do we get people writing poems about people that know other people have committed? suicide or they thought about it themselves like we hear about that monthly you know that is a huge health concern to me that that scares me you know especially up north where like I think this is one in five you know Aboriginal men or Inuit men I think are committing suicide or something crazy like that you know it's just that's frightening yeah like yeah. even even here like you, you know it's not um, uncommon to be like going going to high school, yeah. you're going to school, and then there's, you have to go home for a funeral. Yeah, and there's like not that much education about it, like, it only, there'll only be, I find, uh, education on it if something really big happens, like, there's a like bunch red, of them. Like Red Lake, yeah. Like, there's a bunch of them that did it at the same time, or one after another, then they'll do something. That like, happened at Red Lake? Yeah. But there's um, nothing before that, like there's no education. These girls, it's amazing, you know, at this magazine that I went and interviewed them. One of their biggest problems is kids in crisis. Kids who just show up and like, yo, like, you know, they have this really huge crisis happening. And it's just, they're just a magazine. They're like a native Aboriginal youth magazine. They're not healthcare workers, they're not, you know? But the kids end up going to them. And then so they have to like find, oh, where's the nearest clinic? Oh, where's the free clinic? Oh, you need to go get your medical card. And they, they end up like doing what they can to help these kids because there just seems to be a huge breakdown uh, just within the urban city. The, I think one of the really key things too is that native communities are holistic. So going back to that, it's all about everything is connected. And what the government is doing is it splits up funding so that there, here's the funding for the children's programming out of the wellness center, here's the, your funding for the school, here's the funding for yeah. the treatment center. And when you divide it up like that, there becomes an internal fight between all of these different little pockets within the reservation at least, and certainly in urban communities mm -hmm. too. 
where they're either fighting for the same funding sources or they only have immediate individual access to different funding sources themselves. So then they feel like it's, it's mine. It's mine and I'm not going to share it. Uh, and that definitely happens at Beaver Lake in the case of just as something as simple as the recreation equipment. You know, it, who, whose equipment is it? Where is it stored? Um, who has access? Who has the keys? Uh, who's allowed to use it at what times? And that yeah. becomes a greater issue. But it's not even that. It's not even the reserves and like that. It's the third parties. Mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of, like, uh, Native organizations that, that get funding, mm -hmm. federal funding, provincial funding, that are, that are in place to work for the people. Now, where's all that money that they're getting going? You know, it's going, it's, it's all eaten up in administration of that. Yeah. You know, and it, 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 they're their own thief and counsel, if you want to call them that. There is limited funding for unreserved children. It has gotten better. However, the first six years of his life, he was denied services in a neighboring town because he was on reserve. Like important services, physio, speech therapy. Um, sign language. He was denied things that he needed to help improve health-wise and also like with education. And I am disappointed in our government and they need to be real and really go see what the communities are living without. His mother and dad lived with me before he was born, and they both drank lots. And she and both, she did drugs mostly. I, my son didn't do too much, but he was drinking all the time too. And I know she did drugs and drinking. And I try to tell her, you know, what you're doing to your baby, you can't fix it. I had gotten a call from child welfare up there that they apprehended him at Christmas time. I got him checked out for everything because I knew she drank and did drugs and everything so I don't know what what he went through. That's when we found out he was deaf. He had, they call it hearing impaired. And there was a lot of other things wrong. He, I took him to a pediatrician and he diagnosed him with FASD. Before he came out of the hospital, he had a heart uh, operation, he had a hernia, had that operation, he had uh, growth on his liver that, that cleared up. His eyes were way in. They, I don't know how he was able to see. Came here, the speech pathologist, she came to my place and she said, I can't help you because you're on the reserve. I can't help anybody on reserve. I said, well, that's crazy, you know. So I'm sorry, but I can't. And then the doctor uh, referred me to this uh, occupational therapist that worked out of the hospital. And I took him there every Wednesday, and she worked with him. And she got in trouble with her supervisors because she, they told her, well, he comes from the reserve. You're not supposed to help him. And she said, I don't ask where he comes from. He comes here. I, I'll work with him. And she really helped him lots. That he, three sessions with her, and he started walking. I asked if I can be on the interview for who can work with him, and they agreed, and they did get a good person to work with him. And Gail's been with him all through from two years in kindergarten and three more years, grade one, two, and three now. So she's been with him a long time, but. Otherwise, I couldn't get no help any place. We started right away with um, trying to get him communicating, and we did that starting with sign language. And he started to notice the kids interacting and stuff with the kids. So he would copy what they would do. By grade one, he knew all the kids' names. He could write his name. He knew what, like when you ask him chance, What's your name? Um, Shatow. And how old are you? No, What's your teacher's name? 
teacher. What's your teacher's name? Aurora. Yes, good boy. What grade are you in? Whew. No, what grade are you in? Grade? Boy. What grade? Count them. But two. What about this one? But. But two. You keep forgetting my thumb. Start again. But one. Two. Boy. Grade three. What's this? Fish. Mitts. What's this? What's this one? Shaha. Jacket? Shaha. What's this? Fire. The fire. Everything's developed a lot. <laughs> He's quite the jokester too. This is another way he shows his affection. She rubs your arms and then just let your fat go real good. <laughs> hey. Oh, Chance, I love you too. I love you too. <laughs> he's really challenging. Like he's, I have a lot of respect for his cooking because I had him out of school for about four days at the lake and there was three of us and it was constant watching him. Like you couldn't take your eyes off him. We got a special, special bond. I love him. Like I know I'm not supposed to, but I love him. Sometimes. Sometimes. But that's what he needs, eh? There's lots of... Lots of love. The positive aspects is the unconditional love that he has in his community. It's a small community, rural northern Alberta. They live in Canuso, Al Alberta, and but Swan River First Nation. It's the acceptance and the support being treated as a normal child, not institutionalized. And it's sad he doesn't have the resources like speech therapy, physiotherapy, all, all the medical um, supports he requires. However, he hasn't had much of that. So he's really excelled and advanced for the challenges he has. So he thrives from the unconditional love and support of the community, the children. It's amazing. It comes down to the parents. Yeah. You know, it comes down to the parents being there and learning, learning how to be a good parent and caring enough about your child to keep your child happy, you know? Make them, teach them how to eat well. You know, like teach them about money, teach them about school, like that, that, that responsibility falls on the parents. And unfortunately, a lot of the parents, either they started out really young, or they were, they were, their their lives were essentially taken away from them. So they never had a childhood. So you have these 30, 30 plus, 50, 60 year old men who act like 17 year old boys, because mm -hmm. they never learned how to grow up, mm -hmm. because their whole childhood was taken away from them. Yeah. So I mean that, and that's the issues, right? And then you have the federal government giving these guys twenty-five to one hundred thirty thousand dollars because some white man diddled them, and then they're going on spending this money in it means six nothing. months. I was fortunate. This, my both my when my parents went to residential school, they made a, a con conscious choice and effort 